Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is, I am Christy Baer and I'm the Assistant Executive Director of the Center on Finance Law and Policy. Welcome to our first virtual Blue Bag Lunch Talk. These are monthly lunch talks that are um, given by U of M faculty and grad students from multiple schools. One of the really great things about the University of Michigan is that pretty much every sidewalk brings you to a top 10 school. And um, so this is in some ways a grand experiment for us. I feel like we learned the most valuable lesson already, which is that we probably need music or something when people are joining. Um, but we are delighted that you are here. The um, format of this is gonna be a little bit different. As I said, usually this is uh, an in-house kind of thing with uh, faculty, students, staff, and alumni gathered in a room at the law school. I am delighted that the COVID prevents an pre presents an opportunity for us to open it up to all of you. So we are doing this in a meeting format. So if you want to keep your cameras on, you are welcome to. If you are over it, you are definitely not required to. Uh, we are going to ask you to hold questions until the end. Um, I, have, I do have to do a little promo because this is just what I do. So the Center on Finance, Law and Policy, we have a conference that's coming up November 16 through 18 for our Central Bank of the Future project. This is going to be co-sponsored with the San Francisco Fed. The registration is not quite available yet, but will be uh, coming up soon. It will be a virtual conference over three days. And um, if you're not already part of our mailing list, then I hope that you will sign up. And Tracy, maybe you could in the chat, if you wouldn't mind to drop in the address on our website for them to sign up. Um, in the meantime, I want to introduce you to um, Jeremy Cress. Oh, one last thing, you should have gotten a notice already this meeting is going to be recorded. So if that's not cool with you, you need to bail right now. Um, Jeremy Cress is a, an assistant professor at the Michigan Ross School of Business. He's a senior research fellow with the Center on Finance Law and Policy. He studies financial regulation. He has lots of feelings about bank mergers and large banks merging with other banks. Um, <clears throat> and so, and he is going to tell you about some of those today. So um, with that, uh, I am think what we'll do is go ahead and turn this over to Jeremy. I'm going to be monitoring the chat. And so at the end, we'll pause and you'll have a chance to be called on and unmute yourself and ask questions. Or if you're not sure if your question is good or not, then you should feel free to just put it in the chat to me and I'll ask it for you. So anyway, with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeremy Cress. Thank you, Christy, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Just want to confirm you can see my slides. Uh, is that the case? I hope so. If not, please uh, drop a note in the chat, and I'll, um, I'll figure out what's going on. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'm so excited, in fact, that uh, I shaved my COVID beard uh, for the first time. So uh, thank you for motivating me to want to look like a human being uh, once again for the first time in, in six months. Um, thank you to Christy and Tracy uh, for helping to organize and coordinate today. Um, thank you also to the Center on Finance, Law and Policy for uh, helping to sponsor this research. One of uh, the CFLP's excellent research assistants, uh, Sam Hurd, uh, helped me throughout the course of the past academic year uh, to get this research off the ground. So uh, this is truly a, a project that's been uh, helped along the way by the CFLP, and I'm excited to uh, debut it here uh, with you today. So as Christy mentioned, I write about financial regulation, and I typically focus on uh, U.S. banks, but I felt compelled to spend my summer uh, thinking about and writing about foreign banks, uh, because I think foreign banks are one of the big unsolved issues in financial regulation. As I'll explain on the next few slides, uh, foreign banks were a key cause of the 2008 financial crisis. And I don't think that US policymakers have adequately addressed the risks that foreign banks pose uh, to the US financial system. So in this paper, uh, which is still very much in draft form and I look forward to your feedback, uh, in this paper, I recommend 
alternative regulatory approaches that I think would better safeguard uh, foreign banks and remain consistent with longstanding international regulatory norms. Okay. So let me start by briefly describing uh, the foreign bank landscape. You should be seeing a chart uh, right now that uh, depicts some of the most significant foreign banks and how they compare to the biggest US banks in terms of asset size. The focus of this paper is on these blue segments, right? the US operations of foreign banking organizations or FBOs. In other words, how foreign banks like MUFG and HSBC and BNP Paribas and Deutsche Bank and Barclays operate when they decide to operate in the United States. As you can see, this is a significant issue. Some of these foreign banks uh, have blue segments, they have blue operations that are equivalent in size to some major US banks like US Bank Corp and PNC and Capital One. Collectively, foreign banks today control about $4 trillion in uh, US banking assets. That's about 20% of the entire US bank sector is comprised of foreign banks. So this is a, a significant issue and that's part of what motivated me to, to take a look at it. Let's establish some uh, important background on how these banks do business uh, when they operate in the United States. Generally speaking, there are two basic business models that a foreign bank can use uh, when it operates in the US. The first business model uh, is called the subsidiary model. So in the subsidiary model, a foreign bank like uh, Deutsche Bank from Germany would come in and establish legal subsidiaries in the United States. So Deutsche Bank might have uh, a US broker dealer subsidiary, uh, otherwise known as a, an investment bank subsidiary. And it might have a US bank subsidiary. This is a separately capitalized depository institution that is incorporated in the United States. It has its own balance sheet. It has local management in the United States. It can accept retail deposits. It's insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and it is regulated just like any US bank is regulated. It just happens to be owned by a foreign company. So that's the subsidiary model. The alternative model is called the branch model. So in this case, the foreign banking organization doesn't have a standalone banking presence in the United States. It doesn't own a US bank. Instead, it comes in and it just opens a branch of the parent bank in the United States. So if Deutsche opens a branch in the United States, that branch is not allowed to accept retail deposits, right? You and I cannot go put our checking account at Deutsche Bank's branch. That branch is not insured by the FDIC, but there are some regulatory advantages to Deutsche Bank in operating in this way with a branch. Uh, most significantly, that branch of Deutsche Bank is not required to maintain capital in the United States. So there are some limitations to the branch model, but there are also some significant advantages to foreign banks of establishing branches rather than subsidiaries. I should note that these two models are not mutually exclusive. So many foreign banks, including Deutsche Bank, use both the subsidiary and the branch model simultaneously. So today, Deutsche Bank has a US broker-dealer subsidiary, a US investment bank subsidiary. Deutsche Bank has a US bank subsidiary, and it's got a US branch all at the same time. So it can pick and choose between these different models. Let me uh, just pause for a moment, having established that background, see if there are any preliminary questions before I move on. Uh, 
Okay. If you've got questions, feel free to drop them in the chat uh, and uh, or jump in. I'm, I'm happy to take questions as we go. All right. Uh, foreign banks uh, have been operating in the United States uh, for about 50 years. Um, they began entering in earnest in the early 1970s. Uh, but their business strategies have changed very dramatically uh, in the five decades that they've been operating here. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about how foreign banks have evolved in the United States over time. When foreign banks first entered in the 1970s, uh, they were very small and uh, they were subject only to state level regulation. As foreign banks began to grow, uh, U.S. banks began to complain that foreign banks uh, weren't really being regulated and therefore they had an unfair competitive advantage over uh, U.S. banks. Uh, and as U.S. banks complained, Congress uh, paid attention uh, and Congress reacted by passing the International Banking Act of 1978, which uh, instituted some federal oversight of foreign banks' U.S. operations, trying to equalize the regulatory treatment between uh, foreign banks, U.S. operations, and U.S. banks. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, uh, foreign banking in the U.S. Uh, was pretty boring. Foreign banks really focused just on traditional lending activities, lending to uh, U.S. customers, uh, usually commercial and industrial type loans, and foreign banks got their funding for these lending activities, usually from their foreign parent companies. So Deutsche Bank uh, parent company back in Germany would send a lot of financial resources to uh, its U.S. operations, and uh, the Deutsche Bank U.S. operations would then lend that money out uh, to U.S. customers. Very boring, run-of-the-mill business model. There were a few instances of uh, foreign bank misconduct in this period, uh, a few high profile instances of fraud or money laundering by foreign bank uh, operations. Congress reacted by passing uh, the FIBC, the Foreign Bank Supervision Enhancement Act, in 1991 to try to crack down on that misconduct. But by and large, uh, foreign banking in the 80s and 90s uh, was very run of the mill, vanilla, and, play, uh, and boring. That all changed, though, uh, in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, foreign banks' U.S. operations shifted to a, a much riskier capital markets-oriented strategy. So foreign banks would borrow in short-term uh, wholesale funding markets like the repo market uh, and securities financing arrangements. Uh, and it would then invest that money, they would invest that money in capital markets instruments. Uh, mortgage-backed securities, derivatives. So that combination of volatile funding uh, combined with uh, speculative capital markets instruments created a bunch of problems for foreign banks starting in 2007 when short-term funding markets began to seize up. Uh, debt markets crashed. Uh, foreign bank parent companies refused to shore up their U.S. operations by contributing more capital uh, to their U.S. Uh, subsidiaries, uh, and as a, re a result, uh, foreign banks ended up relying extensively on the Federal Reserve for emergency funding uh, during the 2008 crisis. Uh, foreign banks borrowed disproportionately more from the Federal Reserve compared to domestic banks uh, during 2008. So big problems, uh, and I think underappreciated problems in the foreign banking sector. Uh, usually when people think about the 2008 crisis, right, the names that come to mind are AIG and Wachovia and Countrywide, right, U.S. financial institutions, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns. Uh, the stories that don't really get told, told are uh, the problems that Deutsche Bank and UBS and Credit Suisse and other foreign banks uh, caused. And we didn't see those high-profile foreign bank failures in large part because foreign banks took advantage of Fed lending uh, to try to weather the crisis. So 
big problems in 2008 with foreign bank uh, US operations. Uh, the Federal Reserve responded uh, post-crisis by creating a rule uh, called the Intermediate Holding Company or IHC rule. The IHC rule says that a foreign bank with more than $50 billion in combined US assets has to create an intermediate holding company for its non-branch assets. So that means that any US broker-dealer subsidiary, any US bank subsidiary, any other non-bank subsidiary that a large foreign bank has in the United States has to go underneath an intermediate holding company. And that intermediate holding company is then supervised and regulated just like a US bank holding company. So this intermediate holding company is now subject to capital requirements in the United States. It's subject to liquidity requirements in the United States. It's subject to risk management requirements in the United States. And the rationale for this rule, I, I think, was twofold. Right? This rule uh, tried to do two things. One is uh, it created a focal point for management and supervision of a foreign bank's risks in the United States. Pre-crisis, you had foreign banks that had dozens of US subsidiaries, and they were all kind of managed in silos. Right? There was no uh, nexus uh, for the bank's management or for US supervisors to oversee the foreign bank's US risks on an aggregate consolidated basis. The US holding company, intermediate holding company requirement tries to change that by giving a, a focal point, one entity that consolidates all of the activities that uh, the foreign bank is doing in the United States, uh, and that allows the bank to manage those risks and US supervisors to oversee those risks on a consolidated basis. Right, so that was one rationale, improves management and supervision. The other rationale uh, has to do with requiring capital in the United States. Pre-crisis, this US bank subsidiary would have to maintain capital in the United States, but this broker-dealer subsidiary and other non-bank subsidiaries of foreign banks really weren't subject to any meaningful prudential or safety and soundness regulation in the United States. By forcing these non-bank subsidiaries underneath an intermediate holding company, and then subjecting this IHC to capital requirements, that forced foreign banks uh, now to bring those non-bank subsidiaries within the prudential oversight re regime to have to maintain capital uh, against those, those risks. So in theory, uh, this IHC requirement, very well-intentioned, um, aimed to solve some of the problems that plagued foreign banks leading up to, to 2008. However, there was a critical omission, I think, in the IHC requirement. The Federal Reserve decided to allow foreign branches to remain outside of the intermediate holding company. So if a large foreign bank establishes a subsidiary in the United States, that subsidiary has to be placed underneath an intermediate holding company that's then subject to capital and liquidity requirements. But if the foreign bank wants to establish a branch in the US and be subject to lighter branch level regulation, it can still do that, even after the IHC requirement. So foreign banks responded to this new IHC rule, which went into effect in 2016, exactly as you would have expected. Foreign banks responded by shifting assets out of their US intermediate holding companies, which were subject to new regulations, and into their US branches, which were generally exempt from those new rules. This is a classic case of what we call regulatory arbitrage. Foreign banks using that IHC branch distinction to their advantage. So you can see here, I, I pulled some data on some of the largest um, foreign banks, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, and Barclays. You can see that in the solid lines uh, representing 
their IHC assets post 2016, going down very dramatically as they shifted assets out of their IHCs. And you can see with the dotted lines, their branch assets went up by almost the same amount right? as these firms were shifting assets just straight out of IHCs and into to branches. Collectively, I mean, I've given you uh, three data points here, just collectively aggregating across the entire foreign bank sector. Uh, foreign banks overall have cut 33% uh, of their US IHC assets since this rule went into effect. Uh, and a large proportion of those assets shifted directly into uh, their branches. So as we sit here today, uh, foreign bank branches have uh, $2.9 trillion uh, in US assets. That is an all-time high for foreign bank branches. So just to, to summarize uh, where we are, we've got uh, foreign banks that in an effort to evade new regulations have really changed their business models to uh, be much more reliant on branches as opposed to their IHCs. I contend though that uh, US policymakers uh, really haven't adapted to this new landscape. So I'm gonna say a, a little bit more about why I think foreign banks continue to pose risks to uh, the US financial sector. But let me just uh, pause there for a moment uh, to see if there's any questions up to this point. Okay, like I said, feel free to jump in, put any questions in the chat uh, if you've got them. Um, but for now, let me um, talk about uh, why I think this is a problem. So the, the lack of attention to foreign banks uh, is problematic because foreign banks pose some unique risks to the United States that domestic banks don't pose. I divide these risks up into two different categories. I think there's financial stability risks that foreign banks pose and uh, national security risks. I'll, I'll identify each of these uh, briefly. So in terms of financial stability risks, I, I would start with liquidity. As I mentioned, foreign bank branches generally can't accept uh, retail deposits. So instead they rely overwhelmingly on vulnerable forms of short-term wholesale financing, repo, commercial paper, uh, securities lending arrangements. That means that foreign banks' U.S. operations are unusually prone to liquidity strains that, strains that can jeopardize their stability uh, and spread to other market participants. So I think one of the major problems with foreign banks' U.S. operations is uh, they're much more vulnerable to liquidity strains than U.S. banks are. There's also the problem of information asymmetries. U.S. supervisors only oversee a portion of a foreign bank's operations, only the foreign bank's U.S. operations. But we know that a foreign bank's parent company can transmit risks to its U.S. operations. U.S. supervisors, though, may be unaware of those risks uh, developing at the parent company until it's too late. And it's very likely that the parent bank's home country supervisor will have some incentives to withhold important information from US authorities. Uh, they might not want to share uh, detrimental information if they think that US authorities are going to take punitive action against the bank's US operation. There's also the issue of procyclicality. Uh, procyclicality means that foreign banks contribute more to credit bubbles than domestic banks do. Foreign bank lending increases more rapidly during expansionary periods and then falls more rapidly during contractions compared to domestic banks. So foreign banks really amplify fluctuations in U.S. business cycles. Okay. Uh, for as good as the upsides are, uh, the upsides are higher because of foreign banks, uh, but then critically, uh, the low points, right, are recessions, uh, and our financial crises are worse because foreign banks pull back more rapidly uh, when the going gets tough. 
And then final point on, on pro-cyclicality, or excuse me, on financial stability uh, is externalities. Because foreign banks generally don't pay into the FDIC's deposit insurance fund, they don't help to offset the financial stability risks that they create. When foreign banks propagate risks throughout the United States financial system, uh, some banks may fail, uh, and some US banks may fail, uh, and the FDIC may have to pay out claims to depositors. Uh, when the FDIC does that, uh, it's out of funds that foreign banks didn't contribute to, uh, and so foreign banks in some sense get a free ride. Uh, they don't have to pay deposit insurance ass assessments that could help to offset their financial stability risks. So that's um, financial stability risks. In addition to threatening financial stability, uh, foreign banks uh, also pose some uh, uh, national security risks. Given their cross-border operations, uh, foreign banks are potential conduits for activities like money laundering and terrorist financing and other illicit activity. Nonetheless, any money laundering controls uh, remain inadequate at a lot of foreign banks as evidenced by uh, numerous any money laundering enforcement actions that US authorities have taken against uh, foreign banks uh, over the past decade or so. So lots of foreign banking risks. Uh, critically, I contend that uh, most, if not all of these risks are most pronounced with respect to foreign bank branches uh, as opposed to foreign bank subsidiaries. So foreign bank branches uh, have more liquidity risk. They're more reliant on short-term funding than foreign bank subsidiaries. Information asymmetries are more pronounced because branches tend to rely on management at the parent company, uh, overseas management, as opposed to local management. Procyclicality is more pronounced. There is uh, empirical evidence showing that foreign bank branches are more pro-cyclical. Um, they increase lending more rapidly during good times and decrease lending more rap rapidly during bad times than do foreign bank subsidiaries. Um, and uh, national security risks are more pronounced. Almost all, if not all, of uh, the enforcement actions taken against foreign banks um, uh, with respect to any money, la money laundering have been with respect to branches and not foreign banks. Subsidiaries. All right, I see uh, we've got a couple of questions that came in. Let me pause here for a moment to address these questions. Um, I see Robert asks uh, Are US banks providing this capital to the foreign branches or are they sourcing this globally? Um, good question. So, where does a foreign bank's um, funding come from? Um, they're sourcing funds in largely U.S. short-term markets, right? So foreign banks want dollars. Uh, that's what they're after. And so it's largely coming from uh, U.S. counterparties, uh, but there are um, other providers of U.S. dollars as well who uh, play in uh, U.S. dollar funding markets. So I don't know the exact uh, breakdown of whether it's coming from U.S. banks uh, or U.S. non-banks or um, non-U.S. providers. Uh, but these markets tend to be uh, predominantly U.S. based uh, for what that's worth. Okay, so as you can see, I think there are some lingering weaknesses in U.S. oversight of uh, foreign banks that expose the U.S. to potential risks. In the paper, uh, I propose two strategies for addressing these risks. The first strategy uh, is mandatory subsidiarization. By mandatory subsidiarization, I mean effectively eliminating foreign banks' ability to operate in the United States through branches. Okay. Saying to foreign banks, if you want to operate in the United States, that's great. Uh, you are welcome to. You just have to do so through a subsidiary uh, that may be underneath an intermediate holding company. I think there are a lot of reasons to, to favor mandatory subsidiarization, a lot of reasons why uh, the US should seriously consider doing this. For one, I think 
mandatory subsidiarization would enhance management and supervision of foreign banks' U.S. risks. This is taking the IHC requirement to the logical extreme. In 2016, the U.S. implemented an IHC requirement to create one nexus for all of their subsidiaries, but we still have dual structures where a foreign bank like Deutsche may have a U.S. IHC and one or more branches. The U.S. IHC is managed locally, the branch managed overseas uh, in Germany, uh, and that creates complications for both management and supervision of Deutsche Bank's risks. You've got complicated management silos. Uh, it's difficult for U.S. supervisors to un get a complete understanding of the foreign bank's U.S. risks. Better that we should mandate subsidiarization and create a single nexus for all of a firm's uh, U.S. risks. Mandatory subsidiarization would also facilitate resolution if a foreign bank uh, were to get into trouble. Right now, the U.S. lacks a satisfactory mechanism for resolving a failed foreign bank branch in a way that limits the fallout to U.S. counterparties into the broader U.S. financial system. The failure of a foreign bank branch would be very messy uh, with different federal and state authorities uh, claiming uh, jurisdiction and um, the inability to um, uh, impose counterparty stays, it, it could get very messy. But if we mandate subsidiarization, uh, then upon a foreign bank's failure, uh, you could resolve its U.S. banking activities uh, through the traditional FDIC bank resolution process. Could be a lot cleaner. Uh, Mandating subsidiarization would also reduce pro-cyclicality and the transmission of macroeconomic shocks. Uh, as I mentioned, the empirical evidence on this uh, demonstrates that uh, foreign bank subsidiaries in the United States are much less pro-cyclical than foreign bank branches. Uh, they don't contribute as much to the creation of credit bubbles, nor do they contribute uh, to uh, financial crises uh, as much as foreign bank branches. And finally, I think that mandating subsidiarization would be good because it would bring foreign banks into the deposit insurance system. Foreign banks would be required to pay assessments to the FDIC's deposit insurance fund. That would help offset the financial stability risks that foreign banks create. And critically, uh, by giving foreign banks the opportunity to take retail deposits, that could create some much needed competition for retail deposits. Um, relative to the too big to fail banks like JP Morgan and Citi, uh, which have grown dramatically since the 2008 crisis. So I think it'd be great to have new competitors uh, in the retail uh, banking market. Um, and foreign banks might be inclined to compete there if we subject them to deposit insurance assessments anyway. All right, so that's my case for mandatory subsidiarization. Uh, there are a lot of myths floating around about the potential negative consequences if the U.S. were to require subsidiarization. I aim to dispel those myths uh, in this project. Probably the most pervasive myth is that mandatory subsidiarization would lead to harmful deglobalization or balkanization, right? It would cause foreign banks to retrench or pull back from U.S. banking markets. I find very little evidence that uh, foreign banks would in fact pull out uh, if the U.S. were to uh, subsidiarize. And even if the U.S. were to mandate subsidiarization and foreign banks were to curtail some of their cross-border activities in response to the subsidiarization, I think they would likely reduce their short-term capital markets activities, but preserve their socially beneficial long-term lending activities. Right? Uh, Adair Turner, who was the um, chair of the UK Financial Services Authority, gave a speech in which he uh, referred to foreign bank activity in the United States as the wrong sort of capital flows. Right? All these short-term capital markets transactions, capital markets investments relying on short-term wholesale funding is the wrong kind of capital flows. I think if we mandate subsidiarization, you may see a decline in those wrong kinds of capital flows. Uh, but I think that's a feature, not a bug. Uh, 
right? It, some balkanization in short-term debt markets may not be a bad thing. Uh, and I think there's very little reason to believe that foreign banks would pull back on uh, their traditional banking activities that we, we would like to preserve. There's also a contention that um, subsidiarization would mandate or would violate the principle of national treatment. There's a longstanding uh, norm in international financial regulation of national treatment. This is a, a norm of non-discrimination. National treatment says that host country supervisors should treat foreign banks no less favorably than they treat domestic banks, right? Competitive equity. Uh, but I think it's very easy to square mandatory subsidiarization with national treatment. U.S. bank holding companies, in order to engage in banking in the United States, have to establish U.S. depository institution subsidiaries. So I think it is perfectly consistent with national treatment to say to a foreign bank that in order to engage in banking activities in the United States, a foreign bank has to establish a U.S. bank subsidiary. Uh, that seems to me uh, fully consistent with the idea of national treatment and, and competitive equity. And the final claim that uh, you hear any time the U.S. makes any movement toward regulating foreign banks more uh, strictly is uh, people say, no, you can't do that because other countries are going to retaliate against U.S. banks, right? Other countries are going to crack down on uh, J.P. Morgan and, and Citi, and, and God forbid J.P. Morgan and Citi be subject to stronger regulation uh, overseas. I, as you can probably tell from my tone, I'm not terribly bothered by that uh, uh, response. Uh, for one, um, U.S. banks are significantly less internationally focused than many foreign banks are. So for, for systemically important U.S. banks, they have in aggregate about a third of their assets overseas. Compare that to systemically important European banks, uh, which have about two thirds of their assets in overseas affiliates. So even if the world were to move to a widespread subsidiarization model, that's going to affect European banks a lot more than it affects U.S. banks. Right? So I think that's one reason not to worry so much. And the other reason not to worry so much is that a lot of jurisdictions have already moved to a subsidiary model. Um, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, India, Korea already have subsidiarization requirements or their equivalent. Uh, so this fear of retaliation uh, may be overblown. So I, I want to reserve the last uh, 20 to 15 to 20 minutes uh, for uh, questions. But uh, let me just mention, there is an alternative, right? If we, we don't want to move uh, to mandatory subsidiarization for some reason, um, I should mention, by the way, I think mandatory subsidiarization would require an act of Congress. Um, I don't think that the Federal Reserve or any other U.S. Um, authority uh, has the ability under existing law to mandate subsidiarization. Uh, so this would require Congress to get interested and, and pass new legislation. We all know, of course, how rare acts of Congress are, uh, especially in the banking space. Um, so we may need to think creatively about other ways to uh, regulate foreign banks' U.S. operations if, if mandatory subsidiarization is not possible. Uh, good news, I, I think there uh, are other ways to enhance oversight of foreign bank branches. If we're going to keep foreign bank branches in operation, uh, we need to do a better job of uh, overseeing them. First, foreign banks have to be subject to better prudential regulation. By prudential regulation, I mean safety and soundness oversight. And since foreign branches don't maintain capital in the United States, better prudential regulation probably means uh, stronger liquidity requirements, right? a, a requirement that they maintain uh, more highly liquid assets in the United States uh, to uh, offset their potential for uh, liquidity runs, uh, 
the potential for their financing evaporating uh, very quickly. The Federal Reserve um, has been making noise for the past few years about imposing stronger liquidity rules on foreign bank branches, uh, but they have consistently found uh, excuses not to. Uh, most recently, at the end of last year, um, the Fed said, we know we've been talking about imposing these rules for a while, but we need to have more conversations with our international regulatory counterparts before we're ready to uh, do this. Um, I think uh, the time for uh, discussion is over and the Fed needs to um, uh, get on and, and ultimately uh, adopt these standardized liquidity rules. The other thing that I think we could do to improve branch oversight uh, is to cut down on regulatory arbitrage by mandating federal chartering of foreign bank branches. We didn't talk about this earlier in uh, the discussion, but today when a foreign banking organization wants to establish a branch in the United States, it has a choice. Uh, it can go uh, to the federal government and get a charter from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency or the OCC, or it can get a charter by a state, usually New York. So I think this dual system of state and federal chartering uh, creates some problems that we ought to avoid and we could avoid uh, by mandating federal chartering only of uh, foreign bank branches. So let me uh, wrap up my part of the talk uh, there. I'll just recap and note that foreign banks' role in the U.S. financial system has changed pretty dramatically in the 50 years uh, that they've been operating here. And U.S. policy hasn't kept pace with those changes. The IHC requirement in 2016 uh, was very well intentioned, uh, but it had the unintended consequence of you know, shifting assets from relatively well-regulated foreign bank subsidiaries into pretty lightly regulated foreign bank branches. Uh, those branches, I think, uh, continue to pose risks to the U.S. financial system. Uh, so I think we should seriously consider uh, mandating subsidiarization, doing away with those foreign bank branches, um, and failing that, uh, doing a much better job of prudentially overseeing foreign bank branches uh, and perhaps mandating federal chartering uh, if we continue to permit branches. So let me, uh, for real, wind up there. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, take questions, uh, comments. I'm eager to hear your feedback. Jeremy? Yes, Paul, how are hey, you? Paul Lee. Uh, thank you, this is a great presentation. Um, as, you, as you know, uh, I have represented foreign banks for quite a long time in private practice, and I just want to say I admire your courage because you're stepping on the toes of virtually every constituency, the U.S. banks, the foreign banks, the state regulators, the state government, and parts of the federal government. So you're a very brave person, and I applaud Um a couple of small points, and then I'd be yep. very interested in, in um, looking at your draft article. Uh, <clears throat> but one counterpoint among the large banks, and this is just kind of a historical curiosity, HSBC gave up its last branch in the United States in, I think, 2001. So yep. since 2001, it has operated under your model. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there are many other foreign banks that have uh, given up their branch but kept a bank subsidiary. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect the challenge will be um, that many of the smaller and medium-sized foreign banks that currently have a branch or agency in the United States will find it very difficult economically and financially to convert that operation into a full-fledged FDIC-insured bank. I suspect that the hurdles, the hurdle returns for them will be very, very substantial. So one of the things you might give some thought to is how to deal with that problem, that, that there will in effect be, um, assuming, uh, uh, assuming you get over the political issues, which I'll get to in a moment, mm -hmm. 
um, assuming you can get over the political issues, there'll be pretty significant um, uh, economic and financial issues that will segment the foreign bank industry. Uh, and I think all the foreign banks will oppose it, but, but certainly the big foreign banks can afford in, in a way to deal with it in a way that the smaller and, and medium-sized foreign banks can. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and as, you, as you point out, this debate about having a branch or agency or a required a bank subsidiary has been one that's been going on for years, including the International Banking Act and the study on subsidization required mm -hmm. by that. And the Institute of International Bankers, as you probably know, over the years has done studies about <clears throat> the treatment both in the United States and in other countries of the subsidization requirement. So I think that will be important to, to uh, address in your, um, in, in your article. Um, but I think it is, a, I think it's absolutely fair question <clears throat> um, to, to pose. Uh, it does, it, as I say, I think it does, uh, will require a rethinking of what has been accepted practice sort of internationally for a long time, at least among the largest institutions. But, and so I think, I think the U.S. banks <clears throat> will feel compelled to oppose this. Mm -hmm. Because the foreign banks, the large foreign banks will feel compelled to focus. So you have a constituency of all the large U.S. and foreign banks in opposition to a subsidization requirement. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Paul, for, for those comments. I um, appreciate your point about, uh, I don't know if I'm brave or stupid, uh, but I, I recognize uh, the likely opposition here. I'll, I'll note, Paul, my last article before this was about uh, community bank regulation and making the claim that we don't regulate community banks uh, strongly enough. So um, I, I made the community banks mad with that one. If there's another lobby that is as strong as the community banks, it's the foreign banks. Uh, so I'm just, I'm an equal opportunity offender, I think. I, I'm just um, collecting enemies right and left. Um, you know, Paul noted that uh, subsidiarization is not a new idea. Um, Paul, I think you said it was in the IBA. I think it was in the in FIBSI in 1991. Um, uh, Congress made some noise about mandating subsidiarization in the early 90s. Couldn't get congressional approval, so instead they mandated study. Um, Treasury and the Fed hashed it out. Treasury was in favor of mandatory subsidiarization. Uh, the Fed under Greenspan's leadership uh, was opposed. The Fed won that battle, and uh, this report in 1992 um, uh, came out against mandatory subsidiarization. Actually, my, my wonderful CFLP research assistant, uh, Sam Hurd, tracked down what must be one of the last remaining hard copies of that uh, Fed Treasury report. It was sitting in some library at Duke Law School, uh, and they shipped it up here and you know, we made hard copies. So it's interesting to go back and, and read those debates between the Fed and Treasury about subsidiarization 30 years ago. You know who was one of the biggest proponents of mandatory subsidiarization of foreign bank branches at the time? Jay Powell, who was at the time Assistant Secretary or Undersecretary uh, at the Treasury Department. Uh, and he was carrying the, the Treasury Department's water uh, promoting this idea of, of mandatory subsidiarization. I haven't heard him asked about it now. I'd imagine that he's probably changed his tune. Uh, Paul, you're right. Um, you know, the domestic banks will oppose this as they did in the early 90s, just as vehemently uh, as they would oppose, as foreign banks would oppose it. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I don't envision anybody in the financial se sector clamoring uh, for this, but I think that's part of the reason why we need to take it seriously, because I think it's an uh, underappreciated uh, risk. Uh, Paul, I, I take your point about um, HSBC being the loan bank. HSBC is the only uh, one of the 13 largest, uh, only one of the 13 banks with the largest US operations to get rid of their branches. Uh, and I, I grant that um, you know this may uh, subsidiarization requirement may 
cause some foreign banks to rethink how or if they do business in the United States. Um, Paul, to, to your point of the smaller uh, foreign banks, uh, you know, as I noted in my last article, uh, community banks are really get light touch regulation uh, in the United States. So if a foreign bank has less than $10 billion in banking assets here, um, I'm not sure how much more onerous that regulation would be than uh, um, uh, it, the bank is receiving now with the branch model. Um, for you know the medium-sized banks, I think it's um, you know a public policy trade-off question of what sorts of services the bank is providing. Do we think they're uh, socially beneficial, and are we willing to accept the financial stability and national security risks that those activities pose, uh, or uh, would we rather err on the other side of the trade-off um, and uh, favor uh, more financial stability? Uh, potentially at the expense of some financial integration, uh, just question how worthwhile uh, that financial integration is. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate the question. I, I'd be happy to send you the, the full draft of the paper. Thank you. Robert, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Oh, uh, sure. Thanks, Jeremy. It's a good presentation. I'm enjoying it. Um, Thank you. I was just thinking, just trying to tie this back to your some of your suggested solutions. Mm -hmm. Is there a systemic issue with the lending process? So I was thinking if, if a, a foreign branch is going out for capital to say a US bank or other source, they're providing some sort of collateral, be it a letter of credit or security or whatever, which I'm guessing is backed by the parent. Is it that the, the US source was inexperienced at dealing with the credit risk they were facing and couldn't measure it? Or was it that the parents actually defaulted or maybe a little of both? Yeah, so uh, great question, Robert. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hypothesizing here because I'm in interpreting uh, the empirical data on pro-cyclicality. Uh, but Robert, you hit on, I think, what is probably the strongest explanation for why branches are so much more pro-cyclical than foreign bank subsidiaries. Um, I think it has to do with the underwriting process and the, the, the presence of local management uh, in the United States. When you have a foreign bank subsidiary uh, that has local management in the United States, has uh, you know a sense of US credit markets, I think they probably make um, uh, better underwriting decisions than foreign bank branches uh, that are managed primarily overseas um, uh, with managers who aren't as connected to U.S. credit markets and may not make a, as strong uh, underwriting decisions. So I think um, I, I think your question gets to to that point. One of the reasons why we see so much procyclicality uh, in in the branches may be the absence of local management. Does that answer your question? Is it somewhat relevant to your question? Uh, that, that's. Yes, that is relevant on the uh, on the branch side. On the other side was the people here who are providing them the capital. Are they also um, lacking the experience to assess the risk of that foreign branch effectively? So when, when I provide oh, that- Oh, you're, say, you're saying that the, the funders of foreign branches. Yeah, yeah. so that, that um, side of the process. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I hadn't considered that um, part, Part of uh, this is uh, short-term debt markets. Um, they're generally thought to be um, risk-free because they're overnight funding. Uh, and um, in, in some cases they're anonymous. So th there's not a big uh, underwriting process that goes on in a lot of these short-term debt markets. So I think that the creditors um, aren't, um, uh, really thinking about it in that way. And that's in part why uh, short-term funding can evaporate so quickly because when people get scared as they did in 2007, 2008, uh, you just stop lending to everybody because you don't know uh, what your counterparty's risk exposure is. Um, so, so I don't think that process happens uh, in a uh, very uh, systematized way. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, you can take one more, um, Jeremy. Sure. Um, 
Drew wants to know, do you think you may be underestimating the effect of broad retrenchment by your European banks due to weakness rather than regulatory arbitrage on reduction of IHC assets? He yeah. thinks the graph uh, on slide six might be off. Yeah. Drew, so feel so that's free a good to point. unmute if you right. want to chime in more. So that is a good point. Uh, European banks have been struggling uh, over the past decade, uh, and the, the reduction in IHC assets could, uh, in some cases, be considered um, shoring up the parent bank. Um, but I don't think that um, that explains the simultaneous growth in branch assets. Uh, these firms are still doing business in the United States. They're just choosing to do it in a way that's subject to less U.S. oversight. Um, so it's not uh, so much, I think, that they're uh, shoring up their domestic operations so much as they're just reorganizing their U.S. operations. Uh, but I take the point, and, and um, I can go back and, and reconsider whether there's uh, some sort of underlying uh, weakness at the parent company that may explain some of this movement. OK. I think we need to stop here. Um, if everyone would kindly acknowledge Professor Kress for his talk today, either Thank you all. with your cameras on, or you can do the little symbol thing if you're really good at it. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Tracy Van Dusen from the Center on Finance Law and Policy and Liz Smith from the Ford School for doing the behind the scenes uh, work to get this um, to get this up. So next month, our next Blue Bag Lunch Talk will be on Thursday, October 1st. We will have from the School of Information, uh, Professor Tawana Dillahunt and Julie Hua, and they are going to talk about entrepreneurship. So um, thank you again very much for coming, for participating, and um, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everybody. Oh my gosh, Jeremy, I don't know how you do that with nobody watching you. Oh, hey, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, that was great. That was great. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Follow up thoughts. Um, yeah. the, the, the look at the stuff the IIB has been publishing over the years, because I think yeah. I, you just need to be prepared to, yeah. to, to, to deal with a found. I, my impression is the number of branches and agencies in the United States over the last 10 years have been substantially reduced. And that is because I think a number of banks found the environment too dangerous because of anti money laundering and other things, or they mm -hmm. couldn't afford the expense of all mm -hmm. the stuff they needed to do. So I think at least a, a reference to the fact that if my recollection is correct, that a, a quite, quite a number of foreign banks have co either consolidated their branches mm -hmm. and thereby reduced their number, or in some right. cases, in some cases, closed their branches. Um, okay. So there is fair, that, fair, fair point. Knows,